In this video, we're going to be talking about active transport. Just like any living organism, just like this hyena, we are made up of billions of cells. And once again, what is this little thing surrounding the cell? We call this the membrane, right? The membrane. Now, there are, the main function of the membrane is to control what goes in and what goes out. It's just like a wall of a house, right? So... What are some ways by which things can move in and out through the membrane? Just like in real life, right? I mentioned this before. You can travel by Lamborghini, by walking, by scooter, by parachute, by anything, right? Now, the same way, molecules have different ways of coming into and out of the cell. And they include simple diffusion like here, facilitated diffusion, osmosis, endocytosis, exocytosis, active transport. So these are the five key ways that you need to know eventually. Thus far, I've, des I've described what simple diffusion is, what facilitated diffusion is, what osmosis is, and now we're going to talk about active transport. Active transport. So to start off, I think the best way is to think of this analogy. So I used this before, and you're going to see why this is very why this is very a very good one. So here we have a nice simple scenario. We've got the outside. This is a garden, right? Represented by this tree, and then we've got this door leading to the inside of a house. The outside is very, 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 very hot. That's represented by all of these suns. The more suns, with the more sun particles, the more hot it is. The hotter it is. So you can see the outside is way warmer than the inside. The inside is just nice room temperature. It's a, it's, a, it's a very manageable temperature. Now, like we said before, a natural thing that happens when we open the door is these heat particles will go from where it's very warm to where it's cold, right? To reach, to try and reach an equilibrium, right? They're going to flow down, down their concentration gradient from where there's a high heat to where there's low heat, right? And this was the analogy to describe, I use this analogy to describe simple diffusion, right? That's what simple diffusion really is. Now, what if this happened instead? What if we opened this door and in fact, the heat left the house, despite the fact that the outside is way warmer than the inside? This will never happen naturally, right? Like when you sit there, it's really hot outside, you open the door, the room won't get even colder, right? That's like the strangest, oddest, most bizarre thing that will happen, right? That doesn't happen. Now, that's because that's not the natural process. But if this were to happen, if this molecule went from the inside to where it's a low concentration to the outside where there's high, this would be an analogy for active transport. Active transport. Active transport is the process by which molecules move across a membrane, in this case, represented by the door, from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. Basically, the exact opposite of simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion, right? Because these two um, was responsible for moving molecules down their concentration gradient. Now, we're moving against the concentration gradient. Now, this, like I said, this kind of process doesn't happen naturally. So, this process will require energy, right? This, this kind of is represented by an air con. When you, when you uh, in fact, make your house colder by removing heat, even though it's really hot outside, that is kind of what an air con does, an air conditioner does. So does that happen for free? No, right? It requires energy, energy and money that you, that you had to pay for it. It doesn't happen naturally. Air, air con doesn't work for free. So that's the same thing with active transport. To be able to move a molecule from an area of low to high concentration, that will require energy, and you'll see exactly how. So let's actually look at the real membrane here instead of the analogy and see what's up. So right now we can see here, we're going to talk more about active transport. And we got the membrane here, the phospholipid bilayer. We've got these two proteins here, right? These two proteins, and we got the outside and then the inside of the cell. So basically we're zooming into like this area here. We got the outside that's white, the inside that's blue, and the membrane in between, right? That's where we're at. Makes sense. Now, as a quick recap, remember that these two proteins are integral proteins, right? And these are slightly different. These two are slightly different from one another. This one on the right here is called a channel protein, a channel protein. It forms a kind of channel, like a pipe. Um, and it is in contact with the inside and the outside. So, for example, if there's water on the inside, the water can flow right through to the outside. Basically, this channel has water in it. It's connected. It's connecting the outside from the inside with a small pipe. 
Now, the carrier protein is um, looks slightly different, as you can see. It's not like a clear pipe. It's slightly more like this. So, molecules can't just float right through. They have to go in here, and then this molecule has to change conformation, kind of like this, to allow them to pass through to the other side. So, now they can pass through. Now they can pass through to the other side. So, this carrier protein is slightly different. Now, you may remember that we saw both the channel protein and the carrier protein when we talked about facilitated diffusion, right? That's true, we did. Now, why are we talking about them using active transport? Because the carrier protein is not only involved in facilitated diffusion, but also it can be involved in active transport. So not only can this protein bring molecules from an area of high to low concentration, but also from low to high. But the channel protein cannot do that. The channel protein is only involved in bringing molecules from high to low concentration. So that's one of the key differences between these two. Okay, so this one, the carrier protein, is the one we'll be caring about in active transport. So, let's give an example of where active transport happens. So look at this little buff guy. Okay, he's got nice, he clearly doesn't go do leg day, right? We all know that, he doesn't do leg day. Now, why am I having this, this picture of this guy? Why? Because he has muscles, because he has muscles, right? And a key, um, a key scenario or a real life scenario where active transport happens is during muscle contraction. You're gonna learn more about muscle contraction in another chapter, so don't be too worried if you don't get this. You'll learn about this later. Now, in order for your muscles to contract, your cells, your muscle cells, need a lot of calcium inside. Calcium, which you can get from milk, right? You can drink a lot of milk and that's good for calcium, good for growth and all that kind of stuff. So calcium is very important for your muscles to contract. So therefore, normally the inside of your muscle cell, so let's pretend here is a muscle cell, has a lot of calcium, a lot of calcium. So I'll bring a bunch of calcium in here. Because like I said, these calciums um, is, are, are very important in causing contraction to happen properly. Okay, I'm just gonna put some more to emphasize. Okay, so here we have a lot of calcium. Now the outside of a cell doesn't have that much. So we have like a couple, not that much. Okay, so not that much. Now, because when you contract your muscles, the calciums get used, but they get recycled. So they never really go away. So the, even though they get used, they don't get used up. So they get recycled. So therefore there's always a lot of calcium on the inside of your cell. After a while, a molecule may, may get old and get removed from the, from the cell. And then you need another new one to come in, right? So normally, the point is that there's a lot of calcium on the inside of the cell. So in order to um, replace some of them that die, we need to bring these calciums from an area of outside of the cell that has low concentration to an area of high concentration. And I told you, we need this one, the carrier protein. So how exactly does it work? Let me show you. I'm going to rearrange this. Okay, so let's say right now it's like this. Now the calciums, what will happen is the calcium will go right into this carrier protein. This carrier protein will then change conformation to allow it to, to carry it to the other side, right? So how does it do that? How does this conformation just change? It needs ATP. So ATP will come in and basically shock it, like zzz, kind of like activate it. It's like the key to allow things to happen. So you need this ATP. ATP is energy. So this is what you need. You need this ATP so that we can, you can activate this carrier protein to carry this calcium right across through the cell. So it's going to basically change conformation, change conformation, allowing the calcium to go right through. So now we carry the calcium across down the, um, um, uh, against the concentration gradient from where there's a little to where there's a lot. Okay, so for active transport, in summary, we need ATP, right? Because it's against the concentration gradient to be able to activate this carrier protein. Secondly, we don't need a concentration gradient. We don't need this thing. That's the point. We're going against the concentration gradient. And then lastly, what do we need? We need protein. So always, when you think about membrane transport, always ask yourself, do I need a protein? Do I need a concentration gradient? And do I need ATP? 
If you know these three things, you'll pretty much know which kind of transport we're talking about. Now, remember, why do we need active transport? Why can't this calcium just travel here through the membrane like this? The main reason is because the inside of the membrane is hydrophobic, hydrophobic. It really hates water, but calcium loves water. It's hydrophilic. So as soon as it goes in here and it reaches an area that has no water, it will just jump right back out. So another reason why it needs this protein is because this protein is always filled with water. Okay, and so calcium is very comfortable going in and out of this protein since there's water. Right, so that's it for active transport. Now there's one more thing we got to cover for active transport that's pretty important. So um, we're almost done though. If you understand this concept, the next one should make sense fairly easily. Okay. Okay, sorry, sometimes they just disappear, so I gotta click randomly. For some reason, they just disappear. Okay, that's enough. Now, we're gonna talk now about something called the sodium potassium pump. It is a carrier protein pump, just like this one. But we give it a name called the sodium potassium pump because different carrier proteins carry different molecules. For example, this one is made for calcium, whereas an another one, like this one, is made for sodium and potassium. So different carrier proteins carry different specific molecules. That's important to know. They're, they don't just carry all of them. So there's a scenario, a sodium potassium pump, this one, that moves both sodium and potassium against their concentration gradient. So normally in a cell, this is always true, almost always true, the outside has a lot of sodium, a lot of sodium, and the inside has a very low concentration of sodium. Whereas with potassium, it's the, is the inverse. So the inside of the cell um, always has a lot of uh, potassium. Okay, K plus just means potassium. It's the symbol for potassium. Whereas the outside has a low concentration of potassium. So, in, um, so the cell likes to be this way. And how does it reach this way? Because how does it make sure that the one side has so much sodium the whole time? Right? How do we make sure these sodiums don't just come down this way? It does so with this little pump. So this pump, what it does is, it's going to take three sodiums, so three at a time, and then it's going to change conformation and send them to the other side. I'm not going to change the conformation again because it takes a bit too much time, but it's going to change conformation and send it to the other side. So again, that was against the concentration gradient. Now comes, so that was the sodium part of the name. Now potassium, so once it brought these sodiums in, remember its conformation now is like this. It changed conformation to allow it to come through. Now it's going to bring in two potassiums, two potassiums, and now it's going to bring them this way. And in that way, after changing conformation, it now sent out three sodiums and brought in two potassiums. And both of those were against the concentration gradient. That's why we're talking about this pump, because it is a pump that does active transport with both sodium and potassium. And, you'll, and you might ask, okay, why does the cell like to be like this? Why does it like to have so much sodium outside and so much potassium inside? This is a great question, and this you'll learn about in, when you learn about neurons. The fact that so much sodium is outside and so much potassium is inside is very important for um, membrane potential. And you'll learn about that later, because right now you're not going to get it. You just need to understand the concept of active transport. So again, this process required ATP. Once again, it did not require a concentration gradient, but we required a pump. And a good way to remember this, by the way, for now, is that why does sodium get sent out and why does potassium come in? Because the cell does not want sodium. It's like, nah, N-A, nah. It's like, nah, I don't want sodium. So they send it out. And for potassium, it's like, ah, okay, 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 I'll, I'll have potassium. So that's a good way to remember which goes out and what comes in for, with the sodium potassium pump. Now that's it for active transport, okay? So I'm gonna make, I still have one more video which will be on um, endocytosis and exocytosis and then I'll have like a short summary video which summarizes everything that you need to know just so it's all clear and, and in one place.